Yes, dear Buzzkillers. Yes, dear listeners. It's the Professor Buzzkill History Podcast. You know, we talk a lot about presidents on this show, but there are so many presidents now in American history. We, we should talk about some of the lesser known ones. And fortunately, our great American historian, Professor Philip Nash from Penn State, is here to talk to us about one of the eight Ohio-born presidents. Professor, how are you? I'm doing great and absolutely delighted to be talking to some F- Warren G. Warren <laughs> G. Harding. Most Americans have never heard of Warren G. Harding. Apart from the fact he's born in Ohio, as was I, he and I have nothing else in common. Oh, I don't uh, know. We may find out <laughs> later in the show. <laughs> uh, but he is, he, he, apart from really Grant, maybe, and a lot of these Ohio ones, I'm looking at your list here, are pretty forgettable. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing against Ohio, by the way, but... Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, Warren, both, you and Warren, I have both spent yeah. significant time in Ohio. Yeah. So. And by the way, you know you know me, I'm all big about anniversaries. 100 years ago, Warren G. Harding was president of the United States. Oh, there you so go. He deserves some... Deserve some love just for that. So, who was he? Yeah, so our 29th president, and uh, like you said, he was the last of our eight, count them, eight Ohio presidents. Birth, birthplace of presidents. Birthplace of presidents. And maybe before I rattle these off, uh, maybe the listeners should ask themselves, how many Ohio presidents can they name? <laughs> uh, I, I had to go look it up. I didn't, I didn't know this off the top of my head, just in case you're wondering. But we are talking about... William Henry Harrison, who can forget get him in his long slog of a five-week presidency? <laughs> uh, Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, also not president for very long. Benjamin Harrison, who of course is William Henry Harrison's grandson. William McKinley, William Howard Taft, and finally Warren G. Harding. And yeah. People are wondering, like, is it something in the drinking water? <laughs> well, uh, apart from Grant. Uh, Ohio was a swing state, and so political parties were at pains to nominate people from Ohio in the hope that they deliver their own state. Oh, I see. I Ohio see. Ohio was, a, in, in terms of percentage of electoral votes, Ohio was a much bigger state. For the, in the 19th century than it is now. Okay, so it's a, it's a swing state. Uh, can we talk about these being swing presidents in terms of being ranked and in terms of quality and things like that? Well, we can talk about them as swingers, maybe, more on that, <laughs> more on that in a minute. Another reason I would say to do Warren G. Harding, and if, if people know about him, often they, they know about him as a bad president. And, yeah, and, right. And, there's, and there's, a, there's a reason for that, although one of my purposes here, just to, for, in, in, uh, for full disclosure, one of my purposes here today is to sort of complicate him yeah, uh, yeah, yeah is that yeah. he's not a cardboard cutout he's, he's he's pretty complicated and actually wasn't in some ways was not a complete disaster and i know that's <laughs> uh, that's damning with faint praise so if you look at the 28 there may have been a more recent one but if you look at the 2018 siena college poll of presidential scholars warren g hardy ranked 40th out of 43 yikes which, so he's not at the bottom but he's down there toward the bottom only andrew johnson and james buchanan and franklin pierce those presidents for example who either a helped bring on the civil war or b <laughs> loused up the aftermath so only those were, were considered worse so he and he can i've seen in other polls too he consistently ranks at or near the bottom for years for a long long yeah, time yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and there's yeah. no as far as i know there's no like warren g Harding revisionism going on <laughs> like, <laughs> you know like you know trying to try to Oh, although, what is her name? Amity Schles. There is this author who has written books on people like Coolidge and Hoover trying to resurrect their reputations. I don't think she's written on Harding, but I'm fully expecting it since I think she's doing her tour of the 1920s. Well, I think that pretty soon Harding will be, you know, 40th out of 45, <laughs> uh, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Fine. We have some We have some more recent presidents who might help push him up from the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So what was his early life like? Sure. So Warren G. Harding, the early years, born in November 1865, speaking of the Civil War, born yeah. just after the end of the Civil War in Blooming Grove, Ohio. And no, I don't know where that is. It's, it's, in, <laughs> East, it's in eastern Ohio, I think. Yeah, I, sh- I should I should look it up on the map. He was the eldest of eight kids. People had bigger families back then. Yeah, they sure did. His parents were uh, a doctor and a midwife. His father bought a small newspaper, and Warren G. Harding learned the newspaper business from the age of eleven. Huh. At the age of fourteen, he attended Ohio Central College. 
which suggests to me that it, it, he's no slouch academically. No, yeah, he's, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, obviously yeah. capable of academics ahead of his years. The year he graduated, the family moved to Marion, Ohio, and I think that's where he's where he's mostly that is in it is in Eastern Ohio, and that's where he's known as as coming from. Right. Uh, he would spend the rest of his life there, except when he was in politics with others. He bought the dying Marion Star newspaper and built it up into a prominent small town newspaper. Mm-hmm. Partly through luck, but also through, you know, using his good looks, also his determination. You know, he became kind of a genuine feel-good story. It is interesting. Later, he hired African-Americans at his newspaper and took heat for it. Oh. So even though this is in the North, this is the kind of thing where you win absolutely no points in the white community right. for hiring right. African-Americans. That's quite the time, contrary. Yeah. Marion, Ohio, parenthetically, was a sundown town. Now let's explain to the bus killers sure. what Sure, so this, these, they were all over the country, and not just in the South. A sundown town was a town where literally by law, African-Americans were not allowed to be outside on the streets after sundown. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you either had to be indoors or out of town. Yeah. And this is, this is actually, there have been books written about this, but this is, this is one of these sort of lesser known aspects of American racism well into the 20th century. He, so he was the, uh, believe it or not, the, o- the only U.S. president to have full-time journalism experience. Right. Al Gore, of course, he was never president. He was vice president. He had some experience as a journalist in the army, but that is neither here nor there. Anyway, feel free to edit that last part out. <laughs> he married Florence Kling in 1891. And she was a, by all accounts, a powerful presence in Harding's life. She helped the Marion Star prosper as its business manager, and she helped a lot with his career. She's definitely, from what I've seen, definitely one of these women who is instrumental to her husband's success, but gets no credit for it because she's a woman and, and huh. his wife. Yeah, and yeah, this, yeah. this is quite common with prominent men at that time. There were already signs in his 20s and 30s that the strain of being editor and maybe even a physically weak heart were taking their toll. So I'm sort of foreshadowing his, his unfortunate and untimely exactly, death, yeah. but he had definitely had physical problems. He, uh, even as a fairly young man, he had ter- tre- several trips to the sanatorium, which is often what people with chronic health conditions would, right, would, right. Would, would do to sort of recover. I just can't imagine that the strain of a small town newspaper editorship Appar- would be I mean, I'm that assuming bad. that it's a small operation, and so the editor has oh, to yeah, be... Oh, he's asking, doing everything. Right, has yeah. to be hands-on. He's probably yeah. doing everything. That's, that's just my guess. He was also interested in politics from a very young age. He was a delegate to the state Republican convention at the age of 22. Hmm. Between 1899 and 1903, he served two terms as a state senator and became known, and he was very very popular statewide within the Republican Party fairly quickly. He he was, I want to say, and I've read this elsewhere, he's sort of a hail fellow well met, like very very good interpersonal sort of people skills, very good at making friends, uh, very good at avoiding alienating people. So he then served served as lieutenant governor between 1906 and 1908, and then he was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1914. And as partly this is luck, he was running against a Catholic. Yeah. Catholic politicians still in this period, not, I mean, look what's going to happen to Al Smith in 1928. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Be, with certain exceptions, like, for example, being elected as a, I don't know, a alderman, council, yeah, an yeah. alderman in New York City. You know, being a Catholic is generally, certainly on a statewide level, is a huge albatross around your neck in politics. It helps get uh, Warren G. Harding elected U.S. Senator from... Ohio, 1914, and and then quickly gained popularity in the Senate among his colleagues. So he was also, I remember reading, you ever heard of a guy named Paul Laxalt? No. He was a politician from Nevada back in like the 70s and the 80s. And I remember reading an article about him and it talked about the Nevada problem, particularly Nevada because it was a very corrupt state because the casinos, basically you could not prosper in Nevada politics without getting your hands dirty. Now, that's an extreme example. (laughs) I I get the impression that at least Ohio, if not all states, was also like that to some extent. And I say that here because Warren G. Harding was one of these politicians who got ahead because he went along to get along. Yeah, right, right. So in Ohio politics in this period, I've, I've seen described as a cesspool. So maybe it was a particularly bad state. He managed to establish strong ties to both warring factions within the Ohio Republican Party. That's wow. going to explain his success as well. He was not as crooked as some other politicians, but he did take graft. Yep, yep. And once again, was that necessary? It may have been. The, the one case 
case I know about is that he accepted money or the one th- uh, sort of trend. He accepted money from companies, from you know private interests, whom he would then uh, promote in his paper. Hmm. Well, not yes. surprising. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that was quite typical for that age. And, you know, is that the worst time to cut type of corruption? No, obviously not. But it's also, it's graft. It's yeah. corruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, his father at one point, after he had entered politics, his father famously said, and I'm quoting here, it's a, it's a famous quote. I think it's one of the most famous quotations about Warren G. Harding. But it, it's, well, it, which, it, is, I, frankly, is not saying much because no, there, no, no, there aren't very many of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you don't see a lot of Harding quotations on Twitter, for example. <laughs> no, not a lot. Anyway, so it, it's, it's pretty famous. It, I'll put it this way. In the field of Warren G. Harding studies. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty famous quotation. And here it is, quote, Warren, it's a good thing you weren't a girl because you'd be in the family way all the time. You can't say no. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah, Yikes. By, by the way, and it has the additional additional <laughs> yeah, advantage of being <laughs> insightful. In other words, I think it really does describe <laughs> a major flaw in his character, which is he's he, he's he's amenable. He's, he's pliable. He's a yes man. He doesn't want to say no to anybody. In this case, his father puts it in a rather colorful way. <laughs> but yeah, he apparently couldn't say no. And you're and I think it's going to help explain some of the some of the really bad parts of his presidency. Well, how did he get to be president? How did he get to be president? So 1920 was an election year. Again, part of this is, is luck. Politics is largely about timing. If you're a Republican running in 1920, your timing's great because you're coming at the end of two years of Democratic rule, and not right, just not, right, sorry, right. two terms. Two, when w- Wilson was president, the Democrat, not just two two terms of the other party, but two terms that the other party only had because of the quirky 1912 election. In other words, this yeah, was yeah, a, yeah, if yeah, you look yeah, at yeah. like things like v- voter registration, this was a period of Republican dominance. Yeah, yeah. If not for 1912, you would have had a straight string of Republican presidents. I'm quite confident. Mm. So, in a way, getting another Republican president is quote unquote natural. And Woodrow Wilson happens to be very unpopular. Right? There's a lot of turmoil right. in the country as of 1920. We talked about this in another episode if you look at 1919 so what's interesting about this and people will find this interesting his wife florence dreaded him running for president and so she consulted with her astrologer uh that happens at least once more in american history (laughs) i think really nancy reagan Oh, right. Probably uh, probably not with the same foreboding. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> anyway, so Florence Harding's astrologer predicted that her husband would win the presidency, but would not survive his term. Ew. And all I can say is yeah. it's going to lead me to question any doubting I had about astrology. Anyway, I would like to bust a mini myth right here, if okay. I may. Okay. I know this is the place for it. He did not win the nomination, the, the Republican nomination in 1920, because he was handpicked by Senate bosses or oil interests. And by the way, I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure that this is, if it didn't invent the term, this popularized the term, the smoke-filled room. Oh, I Because he, was, he yeah. was not a, going into the campaign, he was not a front runner. And uh-huh. he ended up with a nomination. And a lot of people suspect that this was all these deal makers, you know, the yeah, sort of sure. all yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, great, yeah. great eminences of the Republican Party got, sat down in a smoke-filled room and picked Warren G. Harding. Apparently that's a myth. He entered the race as Ohio's favorite son to keep the state Republican and to help his reelection to the Senate. I don't think he sincerely believed he would become president when he threw his hat in the ring. Oh, wow. Okay. But basically what happened, this has happened in some other cases, the front runners, people like Leonard Wood, they took each other out. Yeah. Yeah. Which opened the field for him. And so he was nominated on the ninth ballot. And remember, this is back when (laughs) conventions actually selected delegates. Yeah. And weren't just these these three days of partying and free advertising on television. You didn't have primaries yet. And the business was actually conducted in the convention. And then you have to pity people like the Democrats in 1924 who take 103 ballots to nominate a complete no name and then get crushed. Anyway, so he was he was widely popular. He, he's, you know, in some ways he's sort of an obvious choice, certainly within Ohio and in some, in some senses in the broader Republican Party. He was a lot of people's, you and I were talking off mic about rank choice voting. He was a lot of people's second choice. Yeah, right, right. Right, sort of an unobjectionable second boy, voice, uh, second choice. And so if the, if the front runners knock themselves, uh, take each other down... He's there to waltz in and pick it up, and which he does on the ninth ballot. So people in 1920, as I sort of alluded to a minute ago, people were tired of the chaos, right? All the tumult of the progressive period, World War I, the painful, painful transition back to peace, all the, the, the radicalism, the anarchism, the, the race riots, all the, the Palmer raids, all the stuff of the preceding sort of the year, so 1919 and 1920. The Democrats were probably going to lose. Right. I think just about, it's a, it's a frivolous what if, but I, I 
suspect just about any Republican would have won in 1920. And Hart, in, in another sense, in terms of not just saying he, he's a, a Republican, he was perfect for the national mood. He famously said in his speech, quote, he, pro- he promised, quote, not heroics, but helping, not n- nostrums, but normalcy. And, I don't know, and I've seen different accounts of this. I always doubted that normalcy was, a, was a, an actual word. I thought the word was normality. Well, I think it is. I think Harding said normalcy. Right, That's and then that it, helped make it legit? Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. I, I, maybe yeah. I need to look in that again. But normalcy just sounds like a, like, a non, awful, yeah. like a non-word to me. Yeah. But So we can thank him for expanding our vocabulary. By the way, people criticized Biden for you know saying no malarkey, no more malarkey, and, and what, <laughs> yeah. what was it? The build back better, not being, <laughs> not being great slogans, but not heroics, but helping? That's yeah. about as lame as it yeah, gets. Yeah, you know, you're right. That's some pretty lame speech writing. I don't know for a fact. It's a, it's possible he wrote it himself. But then again, he's a <laughs> newspaper editor. He ought to know how to write. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so he's modest. He was low key. He was pleasant. He had very few enemies. He's unassuming. In a way, he's perfect for the moment. He's not. It's not just because he's a Republican. He's perfect for the moment. When he when he promises to dial everything back and let's just take it easy for a while, he was speaking for millions of Americans yeah, in 1920. Think, there's there's yeah. no question about that. Yeah. The convention chose. I have in my notes a silent Cal. Yeah. The, the, the convention chose uh, Calvin Coolidge, the governor of Massachusetts, as his running mate. And Harding ran against the Democratic nominee, James Cox. Now, there's a household name. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> James Cox, who, by the way, was also, and it's one of my favorite things about 1920, he was also an Ohio newspaper editor. There you go. There you go. <laughs> we should just have one election Dest- where yeah, two right. newspaper editors from the same state <laughs> go at it. Yeah. Pretty crazy. And uh, his running mate was, much more famously, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Oh, that guy. Yeah, the assistant secretary of the Navy got the nomination for the Democratic uh, vice presidency slot. And of course, then in the following year, he's going to be struck down by polio. In any case, so it was Harding and Coolidge versus Cox and Roosevelt. It was a blowout. I've said this in another show. I have to give a shout out to to Pittsburgh, PA. This is where the, the first radio broad, the first radio broadcast was the broadcast of the election returns. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. election day, 1920, KDKA in Pittsburgh, the first ever. So we are entering the radio age. Harding received 60.3% of the popular vote. In terms of popular vote, that is a capital L landslide. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Look across absolutely. our elections. Presidents rarely get, of course, we live in an age when they don't, they don't even win the popular vote at all and get elected <laughs> president. He he uh, won overwhelmingly. He received 404 electoral votes. 404? Every single state outside the South and Kentucky. And wow. this is back, by the way, just to check in with people, this is when the so-called solid South was yeah. a thing. The South always went Democratic, yeah, yeah, no yeah. matter what. The South is going to go Democratic for, well, actually not all of it, but most of the South is going to go Democratic in 1928 for a Catholic <laughs> through, through gritted teeth, yeah, I have no amazing, doubt. Amazing, actually. Yeah, anyway, so he's, so he's elected president in November 1920. So then what was the presidency itself like, which of course his wife had dreaded? Yes, what was his presidency like? Like I said, more interesting and more complicated than you might think. Let me first get this out of the way, his personal life, which was also, shall we say, complicated. <laughs> he had multiple affairs, even though he was married throughout this period. He had a long-standing affair with a woman by the name of Carrie Phillips, who was also married. Carrie Phillips and her husband were close friends of Harding and his wife. Bob and Carol, Ted and Alice. Pretty much, yes. Thank you for that reference. So... They had an affair for 15 years up until 1920. In 2014, some of Harding's love letters were released. And I'm not going to quote from the here. But they are, shall we say, extremely explicit. Yeah, this is a PG show. Yeah, and this is some R-rated archival material. Very explicit. I was racking my brain. You know, we've had a lot of presidents do some rather untoward stuff, but I can't think of another president who wrote down anything as raunchy as these letters that Harding wrote. And and, and by the way, and when you look at some of them, you can realize why they were only released in 2014. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this yeah. Stuff, this sort of stuff doesn't see the light of day very quickly. There is, uh, I will mention it here, people should go on YouTube, I'm pretty sure it's still there. That there may even be two of them, one longer, one shorter. John Oliver uh, on his show, which is called what, Last Night Tonight? Something like that. But anyway, yeah. the John Oliver show, he's brilliant by the way, I'm a big fan. He did a segment or two on Warren G. Harding. So I strongly urge people to go to YouTube and search John Oliver, Warren G. 
Harding. And you can hear them a quote from some of these letters. And it is, it, it's funny and informing. I will try to put a link for that on the blog post. I would highly recommend that. It's outstanding. So in 1920, the affair with Carrie Phillips ended, but only after the Republican Party essentially bought her silence. They didn't mm-hmm. want a, what did they call him in 92? A bimbo eruption? Mm. I don't know if I don't know if we should put that in there. They, they worried that, that she was going to damage his campaign, so they bought her silence. The press knew, by the way, knew about this affair, but kept it quiet. And you're going to see this later on, too. The press knew about John F. Kennedy's affairs, right? The, the press yeah. uh, has often been complicit in, in the long sweep of U.S. history, anyway, complicit with, with hiding the, the, the dirty secrets of presidents. Later, and while in the White House, Harding had an affair with a woman by the name of Nan Britton. She alleged that Warren G. Harding fathered her daughter. Uh-huh. And later, DNA, a DNA test proved that her accusation was was correct. There is, I don't know if it was in her book, but I've seen at least one account of Nan Britton and Warren Harding having sex in a White House closet. There's, there, there's your tax dollars at work. <laughs> And so she wrote a book, uh, which was published in 1927, and, and I'm not making this up. This book was literally sold, it was so salacious for that time, it was literally sold door to door in a plain brown wrapper. Wow. And apparently sold rather well, <laughs> <laughs> because people were interested in this sort of thing. Yeah, but it was essentially treated like pornography, the way it was distributed. So... Considering his bad reputation, there are some surprises in his presidency. And like I said, I'm I'm not saying he's good. I'm just saying he's more complicated, like most people, right? Very few people in history are sort of complete cardboard cutouts. Some of his uh, cabinet appointments, and I'm going to say more about his bad appointments in a minute, but some of his appointments were quite good. People Mm -hmm. like uh, Charles Evans Hughes at the State Department, Herbert Hoover, Mm -hmm. to the extent that historians rate commerce secretaries, probably the best commerce commerce secretary we've ever had in our history. Uh, Andrew Mellon, a little more controversial, especially when you get to the the Great Depression. Henry C. Wallace, I'm pretty sure is the father of Henry A. Wallace. He was a terrific secretary of agriculture. So there were some real strong appointments. Like I said, however, see below. (laughs) <laughs> there are going to be some appointments which, which, appointments which are not quite so good, if not to say disastrous. <laughs> he also deserves some credit for his stances on the race issue. So keep in mind, this is in the still in the heart of the Jim Crow era. This is at a time when, during his presidency, they dedicated the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and the dedication cer- ceremony was racially segregated. I don't know how many of the listeners know that. Yeah, we should repeat that. The dedication ceremony for the Lincoln Memorial... The Great Emancipator yes. was racially was segregated. racially segregated. African Americans were attended the event, but they had to sit at the back. Well, and, and I remember you and I talking about the memorial. Which, it, by the way, there's a show, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do. absolutely. And we talk about it. And you go to it and you see this, and inside the all the things about Lincoln. Nothing about emancipation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's all about reuni- reunification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's about the union. Yeah. yeah. So then that was that, like when we talked about this and then when we talked about Confederate monuments, it's a product of its time. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, the memorial and the way it was dedicated also tells you a lot about that time period. So this was a bad, this was a bad time. But Harding, certainly compared to other presidents, certainly compared to other Republicans, which was the racially progressive party at that time yeah. compared to the Democrats, he stands out as a progressive. He supported an anti-lynching law which he never got to sign because it's never going to come out of the Senate, right? It's going to be filibustered yeah, to sure, death, yeah, as it yeah, was on yeah. multiple occasions through the FDR years, by the way. Yep, yep. And by the way, FDR, a Democrat, terrified of Southern Democrats, never got behind an anti-lynching bill. Yep. So Harding deserves some credit for that. He gave a speech in 1921 in Alabama to a segregated audience which was a full-throated call for racial equality. Wow. So now, you can do that because you're a Republican and you know you're not trying to win any Alabama votes because you're not going to get any. Right. Anyway, Nevertheless, yeah. that took some courage yeah. and it's something he did not have to do and yet he did it. So he deserves some credit for that. He also deserves credit for his foreign policy. Like I said, he appointed Charles Evans Hughes. It was on uh, under Harding that we concluded the Washington Naval Treaty, which was the first strategic arms limitations treaty ever, and helped preserve the world peace through the 1920s. So he deserves some credit for that. On policy, he was in some ways a very orthodox conservative Republican, right? All about tax cuts, all about shrinking the size of government for better and worse. He was at least partly responsible for some of the impressive economic growth after the economy recovered in the years after 1922. But of course, because of the tax cut, it also worsened inequality. 
And tax, by the way, taxes had been, well, first of all, income, we talked about this in our tax show, taxes were relatively new in this time period, and they were relatively high during World War I, so it's in some ways an obvious and popular move to, to knock tax rates back down again right. after the war. I don't know how much credit he deserves for this, but he had no, how can I put this? You can't accuse him of suffering from a Dunning-Kruger. <laughs> he, 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 it's not like he was mediocre, but thought he was brilliant intellectually. Right. He was all too aware of his own intellectual limitations. He and he and forget about intellect. He was very honest with himself about his inadequacy for the job and made this clear in the presence of other people. There's this famous anecdote, which I'll share, where he didn't know what to do on a particular issue. And he was complaining, I think it was to one of his subordinates. And he ba this is a basic quote, almost a quotation. He basically said, there's this issue in front of me. And one expert comes in and lays out one side of the case. And I'm 100% convinced. And that's what I'm going to do. And then next comes in another expert who takes the exact opposite view and lays out an equally compelling case that also convinces me 100% and I don't know what to do. Yeah. So on the one hand, he deserves some honesty for that. I'm sure that's the sort of thing that a lot of presidents deal with. And would never sip up, would never say out loud. Exactly. Would never say out loud. But on the other hand, you also then have to pull the trigger and you have to make a choice. Oh, yeah, and, well, you exactly. know, and he would sort of hem and haw and dither and sort of just sort of pull his hair out because he was sort of indecisive. But I think that's sort of a telling anecdote about Harding as well. Okay, now, but we can't go too far, obviously, without talking about the scandals. There, apart from these other affairs that you mentioned before, there were scandals, right? There were scandals there. He, he, he is known, his administration is known for its scandals for a very good reason. <laughs> <laughs> and by that, I mean for several good reasons. His administration has a reputation for being one of the most corrupt, and that's because it was one of the most corrupt. Right. There's no question about it. Another, since I'm all about the famous, the famous, quote unquote, quote unquote, famous Harding quotes, one of his most famous, forget about the one by, by his dad, one of the most famous quotes by Harding and one of the most telling quotes about the nature of his presidency was this one, and I'm quoting, I have no trouble with my enemies, but my damn friends, my goddamn friends, they're the ones that keep me walking the floor nights, <laughs> end quote. And I think that's actually pretty insightful because like yeah, I said, yeah. he, he didn't say no to people. He was very friendly. He made a lot of friends, but he wasn't choosy. Right? And he, he didn't have to worry about his enemies. Not while he was president. He had to worry about his friends. Yeah. And the problem is that is where the buck stops. <laughs> because Warren G. Harding was the one who gave jobs to a lot of his friends. And there was this, his, his cronies were known as the Ohio Gang. And that right there is not a good yeah, sign. Sure, yeah. A lot of these people were hired out of loyalty. And other presidents have done this. And by the way, and other presidents have had made mistakes for this reason, right? You hire someone because they work for you and they're loyal. Yeah, and then yeah, it yeah. turns out that it was, it was a mistake to hire them for other reasons. Or or these are people, I'll put it this way, people who then exploit the fact that you are loyal yep. to them and use advantage of their position. So a lot of the, the several members of the Ohio gang set up shop in Washington, D.C. and became flagrant influence peddlers. Wow. Openly selling access to the president in, in return for cash. A lot of these people accepted kickbacks, uh, shared in the profits of political fixing and, uh, and, and shared in some of the profits of bootleggers. Because remember, this is the first presidency... Oh, right. When, yeah, yeah. well, technically it was the end of Wilson, but this is the first full presidency when national prohibition is effect. So there's much more illegal money sloshing around chasing political influence. And a lot of his cronies dip into those pools. There's also a separate scandal at the Veterans Bureau mm -hmm. run by Charles Forbes. It's the precursor of the Veterans Administration. This is this is right, where, this okay, is after yeah, World War yeah. One. This is the f the first time the federal government is just trying to deal with the veteran population on a systematic basis. Charles Forbes he conspired with contractors who inflated prices paid by the government and they split the proceeds. Yikes! Yeah. So this is this is capital G graft. He sold seven million dollars worth of United States government supplies out of the literally out of the back door for six hundred thousand dollars. Wow! While the U.S. government was still buying then the same supplies for Veterans Bureau hospitals, uh, which were short of supplies, uh, and then buying them at much higher prices. Yeah, this is classic. Oh, this mob is, yeah. behavior. Oh my God! Exactly. Yeah. The, the, it, this is as if you know this were I don't know the the truck drivers union in, or whatever or the dock workers union. Yeah. Uh, yeah. in, you know, in the, in the worst cases, that sort of corruption. Reminds me of the film Goodfellas. Yeah, a little bit. And then there's also the Justice Department. He hired a his, his campaign manager, a, cr a longtime crony, a political hack by the name of Harry Dougherty, who's a controversial pick from the get-go. I mean, the minute he named him attorney general, there were eyebrows raised. 
Warren G. Hardy learned that Darty's sidekick, a fellow by the name of Jess Smith, was involved in influence peddling. Uh huh. And Warren G. Hardy's response was, and I'm quoting, "Get him out of Washington." End uh-huh. quote. So yeah, so this because and this is important to keep in mind this sort of thing because there are people who defend Harding to some extent by saying he wasn't personally involved in any of this. Yeah. My response to that is. He's also not interested in putting a stop to it no. or to getting to the bottom of it or to seeing that people who are guilty of crimes get prosecuted. Yeah. His response is, get him out of Washington. In other words, sweep this under the rug. Smith, by the way, will kill himself in May 1923 Yikes. when, when the, basically the law is starting to close in on him. Later, Harry Dougherty himself was charged with defrauding the government and twice was acquitted because of hung juries, but his reputation was destroyed. Uh, over the course of the 1920s later on. So he, he's uh, <laughs> he's one of our more ignominious attorneys general. So these are these are big scandals, but there's a real biggie. If people <laughs> if people know Warren G. Harding at all, they know this uh, one. Right, exactly. Let, I, I, I keep dancing the around bomb. the big scandal. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the bomb on the big one. Yeah, so yeah, the, the one that is that people will probably recognize is Teapot Dome, uh-huh. which, is a, which is a bigger scandal. And by the way, had this been the only scandal, this would have been plenty. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Warren G. Harding appointed as his Secretary of the Interior a Senate pal of his by the name of Albert Fall from New Mexico. Right. Who arranged the leases of U.S. government naval oil reserves. So there were oil oil reserves out west owned by the government, and it, it was for military purposes, right? Yeah. Because our yeah, ships sure. run on oil. So enormous naval oil reserves were leased by the U.S. government at Teapot Dome, Wyoming, and Elks El, sorry, Elk Hills, California. So if you're wondering what the, what, what the heck is Teapot Dome, it's a place where these naval oil reserves were in Wyoming. Yeah. So I think these, called Teapot Dome because it's sort of geological. Yes, exactly. Formation. Right, exactly. Geographical feature. Yes, correct. So these U.S. government naval oil reserves were leased to oil companies in return for enormous loans, in quotation marks. <laughs> yeah, people should know that. As, as you the, uh, veteran listeners know, Professor Nash gives us these highly detailed <laughs> outlines, and loans is in loans, big quotation loans marks in, here. In, inverted commas for a reason. So these were personal loans given to Albert Fall in the amount of four hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Which today is six mil. Yeah. So no, this is money. not, you know, here's some uh, tickets to the game at the garden. The, <laughs> yeah, this is no, this no. is six million dollars in a quote unquote loan. Yeah. And this came to light only after Warren G. Harding's death. Oh, right. OK. And Harding, once again, was not directly involved, but he approved the leases. And so he is implicated. And by the way, we talked about this when we talked about Richard Nixon. The, the buck stops with you. You're, absolutely, you're, absolutely. You are your administration. You hire these people. You are there. When the minute you hire them, you are taking responsibility for what they do in the name of the government. So it was an enormous scandal. By the way, Fall was later convicted of bribery. Mm -hmm. The first, for those of you keeping score at home, the first U.S. US cabinet secretary sent to prison. Do we know whether Fall was from Ohio? No, no, no. no, no, I said he was from um, New Mexico. Oh, no. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was was not part of the Ohio gang. He's not part of the Ohio gang. (laughs) They they should have made him an honorary mascot or something, (laughs) considering his, his ethics. But... He, he, uh, yeah, so he, was, he was a senator who became Secretary of the Interior, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to speculate, you're Secretary of the Interior in 1921, there's probably not a lot going on, no, and you're no, probably no. quickly, yeah. how, can I, how can I turn this into my personal benefit? I, I, can imagine, I can imagine that quickly coming into his head. So it's Harding's, Harding's response to this and the other scandals was basically to vacillate between rage and despondency. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He was very unhappy that these things were, were sort of starting to seep out of his administration, and he was, he was very unhappy. And, and became depressed. At one point, <laughs> you'll like this, he confronted Charles Forbes at the Veterans Bureau, confronted him at the White House and actually physically assaulted him. Really? I, I'm pretty sure some secretary walked into the Oval Office and Harding had <laughs> had Forbes pinned against the wall by his neck. <laughs> Lordy. And, and, you know, we've seen a lot in American presidential history. Yeah, but... Pretty yeah. sure physical assaults in the Oval <laughs> Office, pretty rare. Yeah. Pretty rare. In fact, I can't think of another throwdown in, in the White House like that. <laughs> throwdown. So Harding demanded his resignation, but then let him flee to Europe. Oh, okay. To let avoid him, him, again getting thrown d- d- into the claim. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. And so once again, Harding is not... <laughs> Yeah, the Attorney General is the chief law enforcement officer. We talked about this in another show. Part of the president's job is to see that the laws are faithfully executed, yeah. oh, not, yeah. not to suspect one of your underlings of illegality and then let them flee the jurisdiction. Yeah. <laughs> then you're not supposed to do that. So he, he clearly just didn't want a scandal, didn't want his, his administration destroyed by scandals being exposed. And so... 
you know, that that's also damning. He's worried about the political impact. He's not worried about the just uh, justice. He's not worried about the, the fact that laws been laws are being broken by his. Oh, he is upset, but that's he's not interested in ending the illegality. He's fixated on what does this mean for my presidency? Right, right. And this that's is, not and that's not a good look either. This is ringing all sorts of bells. Yeah, contemporaneously. Well, huge red flag. Okay, this is now steamrolling towards a major, you know, end of ending an administration scandal resolution. How does he get out of it? He gets out of it by dying. Oh, that's one way. <laughs> kind, of an extreme, kind of an extreme. Yeah, now, right. He, yeah, didn't, yeah. he didn't commit suicide, just for the record. But like I said earlier in his life, he, he's often benefits from good timing. And <laughs> I realize that sounds really snarky and really sort of sort of macabre, but the the major scandals really did not erupt until after he died. So backtrack to explain how uh, he died. Okay. Yeah, he was he was aware of a serious heart condition already by nine, 1919. He, and this here's where it gets really weird, he may even have, I don't want to say, say premonition necessarily, but he may have had a pretty good idea that he was not going to live too much longer in 1923, because in 1923, he sold... The Marion Star. Oh, okay. okay. Which he had been hanging on to up until that point. And so the question is, why are you selling it at this point? And he also redid his will, which is also the kind of thing you typically don't do yeah, out of the right, blue, yeah. right? So I don't know. It doesn't prove anything, but it is kind of weird. He definitely, especially while he was president, he ate and drank and smoked to excess, right? He's not a man who took care, took very good care of himself. The This may have been compounded by the problems in his administration. If you look at the later photographs in his life, he's seriously overweight. There's no question about that. Right. He right, 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 right. Uh, had a bout of influenza in January 1923, and you can argue that he never fully recovered from that in terms of his okay. overall health. He had chest pains, which were dismissed by his doctor, and this is not the only useless White House doctor we've had in our in our history. We've had <laughs> we've had more than one. In fact, we, we have had at least three or four that I can think of. Right, the the, the presidential doctor is not always the best doctor in the country. Often, right, right, often right. they are often often they are another version of a yes man, basically tell the president that his health is great even though it isn't. So he, he had chest pains; they were dismissed as heartburn and indigestion. In the summer of 1923, he undertook a Western tour, and it's partly because he was just delighted to get out of Washington because of all these scandals that were yeah. brewing. Yeah, yeah. A Western tour, in, which included Alaska, and I think he was the first president to visit Alaska while in office. Don't hmm. quote me. You know, Alaska, not popular destination for politicking presidents. No, no, no. Um, especially if, if uh, I'm pretty sure it was still a Republican stronghold back then. Anyway, so he, he it includes Alaska, and it is in part to, to dodge these scandal scandal headaches that he's experiencing politically. He had, uh, toward the end of July, he experienced heart trouble, and he was rushed. Uh, he, they, they basically they skipped some stops toward the end and rushed to San Francisco because of the heart trouble, where he then suffer, suffered a fatal heart attack on August 2nd, 1923. And so he died at the age of 57. He was, wow. not, he was not an old man. Very young, yeah. So... After three presidential deaths by assassination, Lincoln <laughs> Garfield, and for those of you who are on the presidential death watch, we had Lincoln and Garfield and McKinley were killed by assassin or died prematurely by assassination. Warren G. Harding is one of the rare presidents who dies a natural death in office. So I would say kind of refreshing in a way after all these presidents being shot. Mm. So there was, believe it or not, a, and I was surprised when I found this out, a massive outpouring of grief nationwide at his death, which I mean, he got over 60% of the vote, right? Clearly sure, a lot of yeah. people, he had a lot of yeah. supporters. He was a popular guy. The, like I said, the scandals hadn't really do come to dominate the headlines quite yet. So lot, lots of people very, very uh, unhappy about his death. I know, you know, I wrote this book about um, Claire Booth Luce, sure first marriage took place just a week or two after Harding died. And at the wedding ceremony, there was no dancing. And oh, it's because, because of, yeah. yeah in, in observance of the president's passing. Wow. Well, wow. Kind of interesting. Anyway, so now Calvin, Calvin Coolidge is president and he will, he will finish out Harding's first term. He'll be elected in his own right, 1924, overwhelmingly, and then will serve until 1929 when, when, when his timing is terrific. <laughs> <laughs> when he also gets out of Dodge just in the nick of time. And by the way, he, there was no term limit back then. Coolidge could have run in 1928 and would have been elected. And then the great Depression would have been his problem. Sure, sure. But yeah. so lots of Republican presidents with good timing. So the bottom line, a bad president, absolutely. Uh, you know it, that Harding presidential glass is definitely half empty, not half full. I don't, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to portray this as a 50-50 thing. Like he's half good, half bad. I wouldn't say that. I think he still belongs way down at the bottom with other U.S. presidents. And like I said, I stressed this with Nixon. Um, <laughs> it's so relevant in some recent years. You, as a president, in terms of your reputation and how we should judge you as historians, you are whom you hire. 
employer or you are responsible for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And his administration, if you look at people like Harry Doherty and Charles Forbes and Albert Fall, this was easily one of the five most corrupt Leave, it, leave aside the question of good or bad. Easily one of the five, maybe one of the most three, three most corrupt administrations in U.S. history. And that is saying something. There have been some other corrupt administrations. Please don't, oh, yeah, please don't yeah, think yeah. that they're generally squeaky clean. He's an outlier. There's always at least, almost always, at least a little bit of corruption, sometimes a moderate amount of corrupt corruption. This was a lot of corruption. On the other hand, I would say, even if the glass is not half full, it, it it's a little bit full. There, there's He's a little more complicated than you might think, and there and there's there are some slightly mitigating factors in his record. And so that's how I would judge Warren G. Harding. Well, as you wrote again in your outline, Aaron Warren, we hardly knew <laughs> Warren, ye. Warren, we hardly knew ye. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, the listeners will judge for themselves whether he was actually worth his own podcast. But, yeah. but I, I think I think it's an interesting story at the very least. Well, this is the first time we've ever suggested to listeners that they go see a John Oliver <laughs> exactly. version of, of American exactly. history. I'll put, it, I'll put it this way. If he's important enough for John Oliver, he's important enough for you. <laughs> I can't think of any better way to end the show than that. So thank you, Professor, for coming on. Always a pleasure. Thanks. And we will talk to all of you buzzkillers out there next week. 